In Lorenzo il Magnifico, each player takes the roles of a head of a noble family in Florence during the Renaissance. If I had a nickel for every single time I've read that sentence, I wouldn't have to run a Kickstarter to run this channel. But don't let that scare you away, because this is actually a very, very good game. So let's check out Lorenzo il Magnifico. In Lorenzo il Magnifico, the players take the roles of the heads of noble families in Florence during the Renaissance. To gain victory over your rivals, you'll have to earn victory points by taking territories, building structures, recruiting notable characters, undertaking high-profile ventures, and ultimately showing your support to the Vatican when the Pope shows up for his visit. Give me the go. I want the go. The board depicts four towers in which four cards each will be placed at the beginning of the six rounds of play. These areas have corresponding action spaces in which the players will place their family members to take the associated card. Each tower holds cards from each of the four categories, territories, characters, buildings, and ventures. First, you're gonna roll these three giant dice. The value of these dice are now the values of each of the player's corresponding family members. Each action space has a die face on it showing the value of the family member that must be placed on it to take the action. You can also temporarily increase the value of your family member by sending servants along with them. Place the family member and servants if you have to, pay the cost for the card, and place it on your tableau. The top row of the tableau is your production row. This is where you're gonna place all of your buildings that you've constructed. The bottom row is your harvest row. This is where you place all the territories that you've claimed. When you're ready to run your production or your harvest row, you must take the corresponding action at the bottom of the board. Each card could yield resources, points, faith, military strength. Some of them convert one commodity into another and so on. Now, during all of this stuff, you have to be paying attention to your faith track in the middle of the board because three times during the game, the Pope's going to come to town and see who's ready to support the Vatican. If you're able to make enough faith points, you get a bunch of victory points. If you fall short, you get excommunicated. There are three excommunication tiles on the board, and when you are excommunicated, you have to bear the burden of the depicted tile for the rest of the game. This could make everything much harder to do. So in summary, place your guys on the board, take cards, build your engine, run your engine, and hopefully a bunch of cool stuff pops out. After six rounds of play and three Vatican reports, the player with the most victory points is the winner of Lorenzo El Magnifico. So this is Simon's very first true Euro game. I mean, this one was out at Essen last year. They grabbed a hold of it, brought it to the United States to put out. And it is their first Euro game that they've put out. Uh, you know, I love games with miniatures and dice and big maps and dudes running around attacking each other. I love that stuff. And that's what Simon's known for. And I'm so happy that they're going into the Euro space here because I love that kind of game too. I love a good brain burning Euro game with a lot of unique mechanics. And I think they picked up a good one here. Talking about the theme, I have absolutely no idea who's been clamoring for yet another Renaissance merchant, noble family in Italy. I don't, I don't know who wants that. There's so many of them. I don't know, there's, there's other things we can do. But a good game is a good game, and I don't care what the theme is, as long as it's fun, I'll play it and enjoy it. And this one I really do enjoy. The artwork, Clemens Franz, is a name that you're going to hear me say often, I'm sure, because I love this guy. Really, this guy shaped the look and feel of the modern Euro game. I mean, games like Agricola and La Havre, and all of Uwe Rosenberg's games, really, and many of Milestones is, has Clemens Franz in it as well, and this one as well. And really, the reason that he has shaped the way we see Euro games now is because it's effective. You look at these games and they're pleasant, they're inviting, he has you know some, some great characters. It gives the game character, really. I, I love his art style. And I think it takes a dry game and makes it feel pleasant. And, I, and I'm happy that it's, that it's in this game as well. So talking from a gameplay standpoint, this game is 100% an engine building game to the point where it looks like you're building an engine right in front of you. Uh, you. You buy those cards out of the towers and you put them on your tableau in your production row and then below it in your harvest row. And 
you have to run those rows. You take an action to sort of run that engine and it goes down the line and each one of those buildings will produce as long as you've met the criteria for each of those cards. So it's, it's spitting out product along the way like an engine would do. It feels so good to build an efficient engine in this game. You look at all the cards on the board and you see each one of them, what they can do and how you can combo those together to achieve even greater goals. And you see it happen when you take that space and it just goes doo -doo 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 down the line. It just pops out resources. It feels so good to do that. And I love that about this game. I love that it's a pure engine building game with some really good tactics and strategy involved. Now, talking about how you build those engines, you have to buy those cards from the towers. There's a lot of cards on the board. There's 16 cards on the board at each time, four of each type of the four categories. And I can see this being a problem for some people. Now, maybe after you've played it a bunch of times, this goes away, but at least your first two, three, four times playing it, you're going to be looking at every one of those cards every round of the game. There's 16 cards every round for six rounds, and everybody has to study all those cards and decide how they're going to play into your, their, their strategy and how you're going to build them into your engine and make it work. So there's a lot of AP that goes on. You're looking at these cards, you're thinking about how they're going to work together, and one of the problems is, is that if somebody snatches that card from you, before your turn comes up, you got to rethink the whole thing again. So this is one of those games where you're going to be frustrated when somebody takes that key card from you and you have to rethink the engine again. And that's where the AP comes in. So it might not be for everybody in that respect. There's a lot of thought that goes into every single turn between turns and on your turn. So now the main mechanic of taking those cards is the dice rolls. You roll the dice, everybody's beholden to those three dice. Each one of those dice makes the values of your family members, your workers going out and taking their spaces, able to get up that tower, up higher in that tower. Now, a lot of people ain't gonna like that because randomness, you know, you can't figure for it. It's not a pure Euro game with, with no randomness in it or anything like that. Personally, I dig it because I think randomness adds, adds problems you need to figure for. It adds to part of the strategy. It's part of the strategy to figure for the randomness. If I don't get that one, what's next? Because of those cards. So it's it literally dealing with the hand you're dealt in a sense. Now everybody's got to deal with the same problem. Everybody's got the same numbers there, but you know, it might not set well with some people. I particularly like it. I think it's an interesting way to do it. And it also adds to the strategy of the game, or at least the multiple strategies that you can employ throughout the game. You can go for a strategy that says, okay, I'm going to prepare for when the dice rolls are bad. I'm going to get a lot of servants. I'm going to build my engine to at least spit out a couple of servants here and there. So I have them in reserve and ready to go when those dice rolls are bad. You can, you can go all in, not even worrying about it, and then just dealing with it as it comes, or you can plan ahead. A lot of different play styles can happen with this kind of game, and I appreciate it. It's really well designed in that respect. So talking about supporting the Vatican and those excommunication tiles, those things are real killers. And really, this is a large portion of the game. You have to figure out how you can get up that faith track and get past that point so that you can support the church so you don't have to deal with the burden that those excommunication tiles give you. They're rough. But one great thing about this game is there are strategies where you don't even have to worry about it. You can just say, you know what? I'm going to let go and I'm just going to do my thing. And if, and if I get an excommunication tile, whatever. And you're going to build around a strategy of not doing it. I like that. I like that. You can make up the points other ways if you don't feel like doing it. It's going to be a harder road, but it could reap the benefits for you. I really, really, really like that. Plus, even if you do deal with supporting the church. But sometimes there's some tiles out there that you might not even care about. Like, okay, it's harder to get territories this time if I get that tile right there. But I'm building for building. So I'm just not going to worry about it this time because I'm not buying any territory. So who cares? You know, it's really neat how that's you can build all those things into your strategy. There's a lot of variables in this game that make it sort of a rich experience each time. You, it's different. You play it differently every time. And I really, really, really like that. Now, in summary, I think this is a great game. I think it's really well done. I think it's a fun Euro game. It makes my brain think in just the right ways. Um, some of those negative aspects don't bother me, but they could bother some people. And so you always have to think about those things ahead of time. 
but I think this is a great first Euro game for Simon, and I really hope that this does well for them because uh, I'd really like them to continue in the Euro game space and see what they can produce going forward. Great game, Lorenzo El Magnifico. It's excellent. Thanks for watching our review of Lorenzo El Magnifico. If you've enjoyed it, please check out some of the other video reviews we have here on the channel and make sure you subscribe on your way out to make sure you get alerted of all the other uploads that we do. Also, we have an audio podcast, the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast that releases twice a month. We talk about board games and card games, miniature games, all sorts of stuff. We also have a role-playing game show called Lords of the Dungeon that releases once a month. You can find that at thesecretcabal.com or on iTunes. Until next time, 